Thanks for being here, and thanks AHS for allowing me to be here to teach everybody a little bit about lupus and where it may have come from. So uh, as Tommy hinted at, I'm a naturopathic physician dwelling in rheumatology. Um, I'm in an integrative practice setting with a rheumatologist, and so we, we have a lot of fun butting heads and arguing, talking trash back and forth. Breast implants, really interesting discussion we had uh, recently and other etiologic factors in autoimmunity, you know, me coming at his prednisones and poisons and him at my stuff that supposedly doesn't work. But we get along and we're a good team and he's seen that in his observation over the years, working with a lot of different naturopaths, that uh, when our patients implement the things that are taught here at, at the Ancestral Health Symposium and, and these lifestyle sorts of things, these patients can really reduce their need for medication. But so why rheumatology? Really interesting stuff. You know, it's just fascinating autoimmunity and the number of ways it can present. And this this kind of very could be really schizophrenic, and it's just a lot of fun to try to sort out. But it's uh, it's never lupus, right? Nunca lupus. I was just talking to Luis out here. So anybody watch House? It was lupus maybe one time. So a little bit uh, just on the sort of presentation of lupus before we get into it, it can present in a lot of different ways, and there's really two depictions here. So uh, the, the wolf and the butterfly, which you, we're familiar with that butterfly logo a lot in these uh, different lupus organization groups, and then the wolf. So the, the disease can be really violent and unpredictable, and so I'd like to share two cases of women that I've worked with just to give you a kind of idea on how it can present. So S postmenopausal women in and out of hospitals since she was very young. Uh, Lupus-like features coming and going. Never really present all at the same time and coherently in a way that would allow anybody to put the picture together very easily. And so she'd gone from clinician to clinician being labeled with anything from uh, depression, type 1 diabetes, uh, glucose dysregulation was part of the way hers presented, uh, widespread lymphadenopathy, so maybe it's lymphoma or cancer. Maybe it's antiphospholipid syndrome. Oh, wait a sec. Some other strange complication here. And then they're back to cancer. And then back to depression. And then, you know, she doesn't get any support from her family members. It's just really tough. And so she's had a lot of the treatments out there. Steroids, Imuran, prednisone, Benlista, cyclosporin. She's done it all. Her saving grace primarily was Plaquenil, which she recently stopped tolerating because of a hypersensitivity response to a recent neck procedure. So some time ago, her husband phoned me when I was doing house calls and said, get over here now. And I go, well, what's going on? My wife's, my wife's not well. And so I get there, and she's, uh, she's on the floor in the hallway, and her husband's next to her. And I'm, in my mind, I'm like, why, haven't, why didn't you uh, call an ambulance? What the hell's going on here? And, She's breathing, she's tachycardic, her blood pressure is a little low, so she's drifting in and out of not being stable, but she's talking to me, and so I'm like, hey, I'm gonna call 911, and she's like, well, no, you're not, and I'm not going, do something, and so, fine. Uh, I'm a naturopath, maybe a bad call in my book, but I put some acupuncture needles in her and gave her a potion, and she perked up in a few minutes. Uh, and despite uh, dramatic improvement with prednisone, which she was instructed to take, for autoimmune involvement of what turned out to be her pancreas, she ended up calling that quits and didn't feel like she needed it. So that's her. And then you've got other women who, you know, maybe just have a little bit of joint pain, just have a little bit of nausea, some rashes. Uh, this recent case I saw, a uh, young gal, well most of her life and will likely be well. And so uh, no major organ threatening disease, come back again and see me in six months. And so. We've got this wolf depiction and we've got the butterfly. My cursor disappeared here. So here's our objectives. So just a brief overview of lupus to teach everyone here what, what that is and what it might look like. And then is there an explanation for the uh, genes that predispose for lupus? So a brief history. For the longest time, lupus was thought to be a disease with only cutaneous or skin manifestations. It goes er as early back as uh, Hippocrates between 460 and 350 BC to describe these cutaneous ulcers under the heading of herpes estheomenos. Uh, this is Rogerius here in the 13th century who described the skin manifestations, manifestations on the face as similar to a wolf bite. And so that's why you see that 
uh, wolf depiction that I listed earlier. The uh, skin lupus has a lot of different flavors. Sorry, I'm having a little difficulty here. Tommy, could I get your assistance real quick? I just need the, the cursor to pop up so I can drag this down. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, I see. So we could see it on the screen. Um, there it is. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, I just want this. Up. I yeah. just want this to be able to slide down. Yeah, but then so then you're not using that to okay. click forward and then. Sorry, go. guys. Okay, so skin lupus has a lot of different flavors. The two most known are discoid lupus, attributed to the French dermatologist uh, Kaysnave in 1833, and then the malar rash or the butterfly rash that goes over the cheeks and over the bridge of the nose, is described by the uh, Austri Austrian physician von Hebra. In the uh, neoclassical period, it became more widely known as a systemic disease, and this is Moritz Kaposi here, uh, one of the first describing that it could involve all these other organ systems. And then, of course, William Osler, if there's any physicians in the room, you may have heard of him further confirming the systemic nature of the disease in 1895. And then the biggest event in the modern era was this, the discovery of the lupus erythematosus cell by Malcolm Hargraves and his colleagues at the Mayo Clinic in 1948. So this is around the time that prednisone was discovered as well, and there was a lot of developments leading to the better care uh, for these types of patients. And uh, the discovery of the ANA test, uh, which, uh, helped uh, diagnose lupus more sensitively. And so, uh, as I mentioned before, we've got the butterfly and the, rat, uh, the wolf here. Uh, the butterfly kind of describing what I like to call this soft, this more soft presentation of lupus, not so severe, more limited forms that maybe just involve the skin and the joints, characterized by that malar rash, maybe a little achiness, get better with some NSAIDs, some Plaquenil, See you again in a few months. And then you've got the wolf representing what we refer to as hard lupus, violent, unpredictable, relenting, unrelenting, organ threatening involving the brain, kidneys, heart, lung, pancreas, women in and out of hospitals, steroids, Benlista, Rituxan, Cytoxan, very violent and unpredictable. And so lupus is an autoimmune disease with protean manifestations, which means the clinical presentation can be incredibly variable. It's a really fascinating disease and ultimately the springboard for our understanding of many different autoimmune conditions out there. As I mentioned before, it can affect any, any bodily system, one, two, few, or several, some all at the same time, some here, others there. Maybe Sue was spilling some protein in her teens, had some fatigue and joint pain in her 20s, some pancreatitis in her 30s, and then having everything together in her 40s. And then there are certain serologies we look for, which are really a headache especially for uh, patients out there who maybe don't get very clear explanations from their clinicians who order them, and they have names like ANA, double-stranded DNA, Smith, Rho, antihistones. Sometimes they're there with the, the clinical features, other times they're not. My primary care provider orders an ANA, and it's positive, so I have lupus, and to that I say not so fast. Lupus can mimic a lot of different diseases out there, and it's often been called the great masquerader. We get some nice sound effects here. And this is why it's so frustrating for the patient. Again, so one, one of my favorite type of consults is the patient comes in with an ANA that somebody ordered, and then we have to try and sort it out. And so it takes a lot of detective work. And I don't always have the answer, because sometimes it's the ANA, and they're just not feeling well, and very little in terms of more specific signs and symptoms, and it can explain, this explains why it takes years or decades for some of these women to be diagnosed. 
Uh, in terms of the epidemiology, conservative estimates by the CDC estimate the prevalence to be around four or 500,000 individuals in the U.S., uh, with the most liberal stats stating that uh, 1.5 million in the U.S. are affected with up to 5 million worldwide. And the disparity in those statistics primarily has to do with how difficult it is to diagnose the disease and the heterogeneous nature of the presentation. And uh, this is a disease that tends to go after women, as do most autoimmune diseases. So uh, 9 to 1 ratio, as high as 15 to 1 in some studies, women to men. And one of the main reasons for this is thought to be estrogen. So women make more estrogen. And uh, there were some case reports, interestingly, when birth control pills first hit the market in the 60s, where uh, women were essentially reporting uh, lupus-like syndromes or flaring of their diseases. And, it's, it's uh, fascinating how uh, things have changed in terms of birth control and the amounts of estrogen that are orders of magnitude lower today. 150 micrograms in uh, the older stuff and 25 to 50 in today's. There tends to be higher prevalence of the disease and severity in, the mi in minority groups, particularly socioeconomic disparity and uh, genetics explaining that. And we're going to focus a little bit more on African Americans today. How it's diagnosed, so we take a history, we do a physical exam, we run some labs. The old criteria uh, looked for a minimum number of characteristic signs and symptoms requiring four out of 11 criteria. There's a uh, acronym that we had to learn in med school, and I'm looking at Dr. Rob Abbott now because he was probably tortured by that as well. Uh, so characteristic skin lesions, painless oral ulcers, symmetric uh, small joint involvement, photosensitivity or flaring of rashes or disease overall in the sun, low blood counts, kidney involvement, low white counts, and then specific antibodies, of course, and ANA. This is the new classification criteria out of the European League of, uh, Against Rheumatology, and uh, the ACR endorses this as well. And so uh, essentially what you need here is uh, 10 points from this blue area here and a few points from this green area, which makes things difficult. So you have to have um, antibodies and you have to have symptomatic criteria here. And so there's more to the story in the ser serological department than ANA. We've also got double-stranded DNA and Smith antibodies. Double-stranded DNA tends to be more specific for Caucasians and Smith for African Americans. And then there's other antibodies like antiphospholipid syndrome, and I think they should uh, mention Hashimoto's antibodies in there as well because that's a common overlap feature of autoimmunity uh, and lupus. And when I say overlap syndrome, that's the ICD-10 code that we use to describe this, these sort of uh, polyautoimmune entities. How is lupus treated? So there's a wide range of pharmacologic interventions not listed here. So a number of them I mentioned in S's case, uh, but the four main guys are Plaquenil, aspirin, prednisone, and bilimumab. So only four FDA-approved treatments. Uh, because of these treatments, lupus isn't a death sentence as it once used to be. All we had in our arsenal really in the past was just a ton of aspirin. And so we've, we've really come a long way. Plaquenil is what we refer to as a disease-modifying anti-rheumatic agent, or a DMARD, uh, which essentially helps pull the reins back on the inflammatory response, influencing these things we call toll-like receptors. And then if you're uh, into sort of the microbiome area, it, it seems to have some uh, uh, anti-parasitic and antimicrobial action is there, there as well, so there could be some uh, reason for disease modulation there. And then the other really interesting thing about Plaquenil is that it's an anti-malarial, and kind of what I hinted at talking about here is malaria, plasmodium infection. And we'll get into uh, the story as to why lupus predis predisposition exists and may have to do with that. But unfortunately, Plaquenil's mechanism of action doesn't seem to overlap in any way with what we'll be discussing when it comes to plasmodium. But I, th I thought it was kind of ironic how there was this uh, plasmodium sort of origin component and how there was an anti-malarial uh, used as the mainstay for treatment. So kind of a funny coincidence. So why does lupus happen in autoimmunity in general? 
Some of you may have heard this story before. You have a set of life instructions acquired from mom and dad, most like everyone else's with your own little nuances. And then we have these stochastic events, a lot of which you've heard of, infections, toxicant and toxicants in the environment, uh, mercury, silica and hydralazine have been studied in lupus, uh, phthalates, pesticides, nutritional factors like gluten, casein, lectins, and so on. Um, these insults are thought to contribute to this sort of uh, preclinical stage where you have this immune dysregulation and autoantibody formation, which is another fun place for discussion because there's a lot of debate as to uh, uh, the presence of antibodies and whether or not that will predict the uh, development of an autoimmune disease later. And there's research indicating that a subset of people who do have antibodies, including high titer antibodies at some point may never develop the disease. And then finally, we have the manifestation of the disease, lupus or whatever you have the predisposition for. And so uh, the question we're going to try to answer here is why do we have these genes in the first place? Okay. And so we already know about, we have an idea of what some of those stochastic events are. We're not going to focus so much on those, but again, what is preceding these genes? And so we're going to talk about mosquitoes and lupus in West Africa. And, uh, this is a mosquito here, hopefully not trying to feed off of the floor, but not my favorite type of insect. And this conjures up memories of uh, some struggles in, in uh, I'm a really anxious and sensitive constitution. And part of that, the way that manifests is, is uh, as a light sleeper. And so I recall these times uh, being attacked by mosquitoes, trying to sleep. and you know, the thing goes by your ear a couple times, and, you know, I, I was always the type to get out of bed and hunt the thing before I tried going back to bed, and so, you know, I have these images conjured up of running around the bedroom with my lamppost shined at the wall trying to find this guy so I could obliterate him after he's bit me five or six times. So, exactly where do mosquitoes fit in the discussion? As you know, mosquitoes have played a very important role in the development of certain genotypes, more specifically sickle cell and certain hemoglobinopathies, and this may also be the case for systemic lupus erythematosus. And so the story goes like this. In 1968, Brian Greenwood, a British physician and researcher, was working in Nigeria. At the time, he had noticed that uh, SLE admissions to the hospital were four to six times less frequent than figures he obs observed back home in Europe. And two other investigators confirmed his findings 10 and 20 years later and noticed that lupus seemed to be less prevalent outside in the community, uh, even less uh, organ-threatening manifestations. Although, you know, our best evidence today reviews of lupus incidents and prevalence pitted against stats for lupus and endemic areas aren't entirely supportive of this, but they're, they're not quite complete either. And so... What this ultimately led to was uh, th this hypothesis where Greenwood proposed that parasitic infections, particularly plasmodium, uh, the critter that mosquitoes carry, were protective against the development of certain autoimmune diseases. He and his colleagues went on to do rodent studies showing that infection with malaria could delay SLE in mice geared spontaneously to develop lupus and other lupus-like syndromes. And other investigators found that malarial infection in these lupus-prone mice could induce remission of the disease. The specific models being studied, lupoid hepatitis and lupus nephritis. And then also really interesting, the anti-plasmodium antibodies extracted from the lupus-prone mice could actually be put into the mice and conferred a protective effect, although that was much smaller than actually infecting the mice with malaria. So all very interesting, and recall that the prevalence and intensity of the disease seems to be more pronounced in African Americans. This, uh, the, uh, the reason for that might have something to do with something called tumor necrosis factor alpha. Okay, And so the uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha is essentially a pro-inflammatory cytokine, which I'll just refer to as TNF moving forward. It's a prime part of what we call your acute phase response. So you have some kind of insult, a bacteria, a toxin, a food protein, and essentially a fire alarm gets pulled. And part of that response 
part of that fire alarm pulling is TNF. And so if you haven't heard of these cytokines, they're essentially text messages to your homeland security saying, we need inflammation now, we're preparing for a skirmish. And so we don't measure TNF in the clinic. We usually track lupus with things like CRP, ESRs, blood counts, and complements, which are all uh, distal to TNF. Uh, but there are a few drugs that target TNF, which, is, which we'll return to uh, in a moment here because I think it adds to the story in an interesting way. And so a plasmodium infection, TNF, what we've learned about TNF is it's not just a, a, a trigger for inflammation, but it also plays an immunoregulatory role. And so you've got two specific arms of your specific uh, uh, immune system, your Th1 and Th2, and it seems that the autoimmune diseases that are characterized, uh, one of the autoimmune diseases that seems to be characterized by a, a Th2 uh, Two preponderance is lupus, and so if you have the infection, you get the TNF, Th1 preponderance, and it seems to quiet the disease. And so the idea is that uh, West Africans have these polymorphisms in TNF genes that were selected for by malarial infection that protect against SLE. And so we, we use TNFs in rheumatic patients who have diseases where TNF seems to be a big player in activating the immune process, and rheumatoid arthritis is, is a big one. And then a category of the diseases that we call seronegative spondyloarthropathies, so this includes psoriasis, uh, psoriatic arthritis, Crohn's ulcerative colitis, ankylosing spondylitis, these are all HLA-B27 associated disorders. And blocking TNF here seems to do a really good thing. And in a lot of cases, the results are miraculous. And you've seen the commercials, the glowing, smiley, elderly woman who's doing backflips and cartwheels and beating her husband at arm wrestling. She doesn't have synovitis anymore. In part, there's these drugs like Humira, Enbrel, and Remicade to, to thank. But what's interesting is that they can actually trigger lupus, okay? So you're blocking TNF, and we mentioned TNF's immunoregulatory role. So I got to share this case with you that I learned about from this rheumatologist I was listening to, and he had this lady come out uh, from Greece who was told she had ankylosing spondylitis by one of the best rheumatologists she's ever seen. And she comes in demanding Remicade because that's the biologic agent that she was getting before. And so before he writes her prescription for that, he wants to see some evidence that she actually has uh, ankylosing spondylitis. And so she hands him a bone scan, and she says, see, I have ankylosing spondylitis. And he looks at her bone scan and starts chuckling, and he says, lady, those aren't your SI joints, those are your kidneys. And so apparently the previous doctor who had saw her said that her kidneys were her sacroiliac joints and was treating her with uh, Remicade, and that wasn't indicated for her. And so what ended up happening when he worked her up further was he found that uh, she actually had... Uh, she had fibromyalgia, which she treated differently, but uh, she was developing a lupus-like syndrome that was due to her being on this TNF agent. So he holds the Remicade, uh, and her antibodies and her symptoms get better, and he treated her fibromyalgia with uh, Lunesta, which improved a lot of her symptoms. And so it goes back to what we spoke about before, uh, described in this review on anti-TNS induced by lupus, Williams and friends described this cytokine shift hypothesis that proposes the pharmacologic uh, systemic blockade of TNF alpha suppresses production of Th1 cytokines, thereby driving the immune responses toward Th2, IL-10, and interferon gamma. And so downstream of these events are uh, lupus and I tried to find some data on the incidence of this phenomenon in Caucasians versus uh, African Americans, but there isn't, there isn't uh, enough out there right now. And so to recap, uh, you're now lupologists. Lupus is a multi-system autoimmune disease with protean manifestations. It can be more limited or it can be really mean and nasty. And the genetic predisposition for lupus may have been selected for by plasmodium infection with a potential pathway for explanation being through uh, TNF-alpha. And those TNF antagonistic therapies have the potential to induce lupus-like syndromes. And so some implications of this may be upregulating TNF in some way, uh, 
using immunoglobulins produced during plasmodium infection. Uh, we, I didn't really talk about nitric oxide too much, but part of the TNF response and, and maybe uh, uh, taking advantage of that pathway. And then there's different herbs and botanicals that skew towards uh, Th1 preponderance for your specific immunity. And so uh, I, mosquitoes, I, I, there's, there's ideas out there about treating certain diseases with uh, different infections. And I don't know if we'll ever, ever be there uh, with malaria, but, but who knows? I think that antibody idea is kind of attractive. But uh, being a naturopath, I wanted to kind of give you some points on some things to integrate into the standard of care that, that we do in, in practice. And so um, obviously heavy emphasis on diet and lifestyle. And I don't know if uh, you had a chance to listen to Rob Abbott, Angie Alton, and uh, Mickey Trescott speak, but we use the autoimmune paleo protocol in practice, and I've seen outstanding results with it across different autoimmune diseases. Um, so that or some other kind of elimination diet to implement. Identifying pathogens in the gut, um, low-dose naltrexone, quinacrine, adabrin, and chloroquine, a lot of people give up on Plaquenil too early because of sensitivity. There's these other avenues here to try out, and then N-acetylcysteine. All right, so that's what I've got. Thank you for being here, and I'll take any questions now. No questions. I was just wondering about uh, some of the mechanisms involved in some of the things that you're you're using with your patients. So you're obviously talking about TNF, uh, TNF alpha. Um, is that you know something that we should really be targeting? I'm sort of I'm thinking about exercise. You know, exercise. If you exercise very intensely, you increase TNF alpha. But even at lower levels, you're suppressing TNF alpha production. Right? It's supposed to be suppressing. You know, chronic inflammation, like how, how does that feed into this? Is, is TNF really sort of like the crux of the matter or is it more upstream than that? Yeah, I, 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 don't, th I, I don't know how that would relate really to exercise. You know, I, don't, I don't know if the exercise is really going to influence TNF alpha in a big enough way for that to be relevant. And then, you know, it, in terms of exercise, I used to be really gung-ho about getting people to exercise more aggressively, but with these patients and their functional status, you got to be really careful. And so most of them are just doing you know, light exercise and walking and, you know, got to be mindful of them being outside as well because of photosensitivity and the tendency for sun to set off their disease. But um, yeah, uh, I, I think where the TNF alpha is most relevant right now is, is with these therapies that you're considering to control the disease and uh, the, the potential to induce a lupus-like syndrome from that. Thank you for that really, I think, interesting talk. I uh, was curious, you kind of were alluding to some of this uh, in the talk, but if you wanted to expand a little bit more about maybe some of the practical things that, you know, you're doing, sort of integrating your mindset with uh, the clinician you're working at. I'm, Definitely interested it's coming from more you know, traditional perspective and trying to bridge those worlds. But if you wanted to expand a little bit more about some of the things that you're doing and bringing your expertise alongside the sort of more traditional rheumatology, I thought that would be a really good thing to talk about. Yeah. So my big focus is on is on the gut and um, and the lifestyle. So so I mean, there's a lot of different levers we can pull, and and it goes back to those stochastic events we talked about and heavy metals and toxicants and 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 dysbiosis and nutrient sensitivity and things like that. So basically what I'm doing is, is really hitting hard with the dietary therapy and then seeing what's going on in the gut. And um, I, I just was a little bit uh, rattled by Lucy Mailing's presentation and some of the uh, strategies that I've been using, so I'll have to rethink things there. But I've really seen a, a lot of benefit for patients in addressing some of the simple things that appear on some of these uh, digestive studies and, and yeast seems to be a really common one. And so, you know, I use a lot of Diflucan and Nystatin. Um, Low-dose naltrexone. So uh, there's a rheumatologist on the East Coast. His name is Andrew Sherabim and he's using it in a way that's a little bit different from what I was taught from some of our functional mentors. And so 
Um, I usually like to start that at 0 0.5 and slowly work that up to as high as 12 milligrams in some cases. Um, and then I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll take the reins on the anti-malarial prescription. Um, a lot of rheumatologists out there aren't going beyond uh, Plaquenil, but sometimes the patients can get a better response from uh, quinacrine. I don't like chloroquine so much because you have to uh, pay clo really close attention to their eyes more than you do with Plaquenil, but sometimes uh, switching the antimalarial to quinacrine can sometimes give them a really good response. And then uh, N-acetylcysteine. So uh, that's, uh, I usually use that anywhere from 6 to 2.4 uh, grams, and, and uh, that's kind of also a disease-modifying agent. I have a question about early detection. Uh, lupus seems to be one of the autoimmune diseases that people struggle a lot with getting a diagnosis, and actually probably making that diagnosis is pretty tricky. There's a lot of different things that people can right. present with. So I'm just curious um, what you would recommend as far as things for people to look out for, um, maybe for especially the, those of us who are more health coaches or allergic allied practitioners who are maybe not making the diagnosis, but things that we would maybe notice in our practices, and then um, the testing that we can encourage our clients or even like our friends and family members to go to a doctor and get those tests for that early diagnosis so that they can avoid that rapid progression of the disease. Yeah, um, so it, you, that's a really great question, and it's really hard to detect early on, but the biggest thing that I would say are constitutional signs, and so these are symptoms that uh, the body expresses when inflammatory cytokines are floating around, and they consist of things like uh, fevers, weight loss, night sweats, loss of appetite, kind of like flu-like feelings, and the key is that they will come and go. And uh, with this cadence, they can persist anywhere from a few days to a few weeks. So, so that's, that's probably the biggest key. Um, more specific signs may not appear that early. And, and so when I say more specific signs, uh, um, some of these the characteristic rashes on the face, like the malar rash, small joint involvement, um, kidney involvement, where they're urinating blood, or maybe they're noticing some funny urine abnormalities. Um, those are those are probably the big ones. But early on, looking for those constitutional signs, and then in terms of lab testing, I, I, it's, that's a tough area for me. You know, because the way the way rheumatology is right now, a lot of the rheumatologists out there are really conservative, and they would be hesitant to diagnose just based off of, you know. Um, the, those signs, and even if you had a bit more of those specific features, I think a lot of folks are still going to have a hard time in terms of diagnosis. But um, there's a there's a panel I use called the um, the Avise by Exogen Diagnostics, and and it in includes a lot of these these markers for lupus and other potential overlapping autoimmune diseases. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, everybody. A round of applause for Dr. Mitchell. Thank you.